The first thing I'd have to say to anyone coming new to this area who hasn't read my work is put out of your mind everything you think you know about hemisphere differences because it's all wrong. <laughs> there are one or two details in the picture that are probably okay, but 97% of it is, is completely wrong. So when I started thinking about these differences, people said, don't, don't go there. Don't, don't research this because your career will be ruined. I mean, nobody will take you seriously because it's all thought to be pop psychology, but it seemed to me there were some important ideas and some important indicators there that suggested that there was something profound going on. And what really influenced me was, um, the work of John Cutting, who was a contemporary, well, no, not a contemporary, he's a, a considerably older contemporary of mine, um, at the Maudsley Hospital in London. And he gave a lecture one day in 1990 on a book that was just being published by Oxford University Press called The Right Cerebral Hemisphere and Psychiatric Disorders. And that struck me as very interesting because in medical school, I'd heard an awful lot about the left hemisphere, but not very much about the right. And in that lecture, he said many things that just completely blew my mind because he was he'd spent a lot of time doing what psychiatrists and neurologists don't generally do, which is spending time at the bedside of patients who have something that's happened to their brain and their world changes. And it was this that he he let me see that when people have had damage to the right hemisphere, their world changes in a much more radical way than when there is damage to the left hemisphere. When there's damage to the left hemisphere, often patients, for the most part, they will have um, many of them certainly will have difficulties with speech, possibly with understanding language and they will have difficulty perhaps using their right hand. So this seems very important. But in fact, in terms of philosophical interest and what actually happens to that human individual, it's far less drastic than what happens after a right hemisphere stroke. The left hemisphere person, they may be frustrated by not being able to use their hand in the way they're used to, not being able to speak in the way they're used to. They can be trained to those things, but their personality, their way of understanding the world is intact. But when something damages the right hemisphere, if it damages it badly enough, the whole of reality is changed. And one of the things that he said, struck me as very relevant coming from this background in which I'd written a book called Against Criticism about what was wrong with the way in which we analysed works of art. Um, he said that the right hemisphere was much better at understanding implicit meaning, such as it is in metaphor and in poetry, as well as sense of humour, uh, puns, jokes, sarcasm, irony, all the ways in which we express ourselves more flexibly with implicit meaning, not just explicit meaning in the way that a computer would understand it. And then he said, the right hemisphere is more connected with the body in various ways. It's in the right hemisphere that there is the so-called body image which, as you know, is not a, an image just in a visual sense, but a, an image of the body in all modalities. And it has closer connections between the frontal cortex and the cingulate cortex and parts of the limbic system, which means um, for the layman that there is a closer relationship between thinking and feeling in the right hemisphere than there is in the left. And it also has a powerful effect, the right hemisphere, on the autonomic nervous system, a probably more important one than the left hemisphere. So in all these ways, it's, it's dealing with the embodied. And then he said, and the right hemisphere understands a unique person, a unique case, whereas the left hemisphere tends to almost immediately want to categorize. So it takes the general out of the unique and puts it in a category, whereas the right hemisphere remains with the uniqueness. So of course, these were the three things that I had <laughs> isolated as being the problem with the disembodied way in which we practiced the business of approaching works of art and indeed life and that these things were to do with the right hemisphere and after that there was no going back I mean after I heard that I knew that my life was going to be looking into this fascinating question that everyone had just dismissed and the reason they dismissed it, as you know, is that people used to say very simplistic things like that um, the left hemisphere is unemotional, the right hemisphere is emotional, that the left hemisphere is rational, the right hemisphere is irrational, and that only the left hemisphere understands language and the right hemisphere doesn't, and things like this. But as you know, um, 
because you read my books. In fact, both hemispheres are involved in everything. They're involved in reason. They're involved in emotion. They're involved in language, just in a reliably different way. And it was what that difference was that I wanted to investigate. And so I decided I'd have to do it myself, really. So between my patients and reading and a bit of research, which I did at Johns Hopkins on asymmetry in the brain and in schizophrenia, I began to put together a picture that made sense. Perhaps it's worth saying that every, every brain, every neural network, even back to the most primitive organisms that we know, uh, a creature, sea creature called Nemesis salivectensis, which is 700 million years old. Already the neural network, which has been described as the origin of what would later become our brain, is asymmetrical. Why? Why should the brain be asymmetrical? But it is. Our brain is not the same in the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. If you look at it, if you measure it, if you weigh it, if you photograph it, never mind if you start to work out the ways in which it's functioning. So its structure is different and its functioning is different. And there's a big divide, you know, between these two hemispheres with just a, a sort of band at the base that connects them. Only 2% of all neurons actually cross from the right hemisphere to the left or from the left hemisphere to the right. Why set up a system where you're keeping things apart? This was the, the question that really uh, got me going. Um, and I, I reckon that, in fact, every creature has to solve a problem if it's going to survive. And that is how to get stuff, get food, pick up a twig to build a nest, whatever it is, grab hold of something that is of use and yet keep out at the same time the broadest possible attention for a predator or for, in fact, for your mate who, who you should be sharing the food that you're trying to get with or whatever it is. But one hemisphere, and it is the left hemisphere, certainly in humans and in most of the animals that we've looked at, is the one that is, as it were, in the service of the predator in us, the one that enables us to grab things, um, you know, for listeners who I don't know whether I imagine all your listeners are if they're part of this series they will know a lot about this but it's the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which for most of us we do the grabbing um so it's that's the the the, the idea about the left hemisphere is that it is very narrowly focused and it attends to something that you've already prioritized as important. I need to get hold of that seed ahead of that bird. I need to catch that rabbit or whatever it is. But if that's the only kind of uh, attention it will pay, it, it, it will become somebody else's lunch while it's getting its own. So there is another kind of attention which is quite the opposite of this. It's broad, it's open, it's vigilant, it's sustained over time, and it gives the bigger picture. And you can't do both these things with the same neural neuronal mass. You can't dispose that consciousness towards the world in two different ways. So the solution that nature has come up with is two masses, each of which can sustain consciousness separately, and each can take a different view of it. And that leads, of course, to a different world, because if you attend to the world in one way, you see some things there. If you attend in a different way, you see a different world. How can you summarize this? Well, you can say this very narrowly targeted attention to detail, highly focused, is extremely good at isolating things. But it, in doing so, it it takes away all the context, everything that is surrounding it, that it belongs to. So it sees elements of experience as atomistic fragments that to make any sense, you'd have to put them together and build something in the way that we do make a machine. Um, it sees them as fixed because this stare that enables you to grab something is essentially trying to isolate it from space and time so that you can get hold of it. It wants it to be like a snapshot so that you can get hold of it. Whereas the right hemisphere is seeing that these things are not isolated from their context. They're multiply interconnected with almost everything around them, that they are constantly moving and changing and indeed flowing. So this is a quite different picture of the world. And it goes on that the right hemisphere understands the implicit, the left sees only the explicit largely. All these things are gross generalizations, but we can't go into the detail, but that's largely true. Um, and they become disembodied when the left hemisphere 
is it takes them up because it's taking them out of context. Overall, what one sees is that the left hemisphere is basically doing a representation of the world and the right hemisphere is trying to be there, a presence, allowing the presence of the world to come into being for us. So there's a distinction to be made between the presence of something in which you haven't already turned it into a concept, but you're trying to be there with it in the way that mindfulness meditation trains you to stop the monkey mind, which is the left hemisphere, talking about it, but actually just be there and experience it. That's the right hemisphere. But the left hemisphere is always representing, which literally means making it present again, when actually it's no longer present. So this is a kind of false vision, a two dimensional schematic vision of the world, which is very useful. It's useful because it acts like a map. In a map, all the detail about the world is left out. All you see is just a, a, an outline. And that map is not the reality, but it wouldn't be more useful if it contained more information. So the right hemisphere sees a picture that is very complicated, contains a lot of information. The left hemisphere has boiled this down, if you like, to a skeleton, to a schema, to a theory. So in a way, the contrast that I'd like to make is between the left hemisphere working in theory with maps and diagrams and the right hemisphere actually reporting on everyday reality as we experience it and not just everyday reality but every aspect of reality